I mentioned to you last Sunday that uh, I was not anywhere near uh, completing the message that I started last week. And sometimes I'll, uh, I'll use the Sunday night to finish it out. But I think um, the message here is just far too important. There are some things that I learned uh, while I was going through God's Word both last week and while I was refreshing my mind yesterday on this message, uh, learned something new. And I like that about God's Word. It's fresh every time, every time you go to it. Fresh and hot like a brand new loaf of bread coming out of the oven. Amen? Lindsay is into making bread now. Yeah. She made three loaves of bread yesterday. And uh, for some reason, they ended up turning into bricks. A little flat little thing like, like about that thick. And I remember my dad got into a thing of baking bread there for a while, and boy, we was eating it. And I think, if I remember right, some of his bread turned out like that. It, for some reason, the yeast, it fell, and I don't know. But anyway, I was able to salvage a couple pieces of it with some butter and some cinnamon. Mm, amen. Amen. It was good eating, too. But anyway, the bread... Uh, that came down from heaven here in Exodus chapter 16. Uh, remember that the, the theme of the messages are uh, how Moses was able to bring God's people into uh, first the wilderness and then into Canaan land. And uh, the lessons that are to be learned as they travel through here. The Bible tells us that these things are written for our learning and for our admonition. That means... That Moses, if Moses spent the time to write these stories down, you'll at least be able to spend the time to read them. Amen? And um, thank God for Moses. If you think about it, um, there really is, uh, as far as the Old Testament is concerned, no greater man that typifies the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, thus typifies the ministry of God, there's no greater man in the Old Testament than the man Moses. Uh, out of all the people that were special to God and out of all the people that God used in the Old Testament, there was something said about Moses that was not said concerning any of the other prophets or any of the kings of Israel. And that is Moses spoke to God, how? Face to face. Moses was on a first, you could call it a first name basis with God. And Moses was a humble man. He was a meek man. And God used him. He, he was just, he was a mortal man. He was not divine. He was not God in any way. And we see there uh, toward the end of Moses' life where Moses made the mistake because he let his anger Get the best of him. How many of you have ever done that? Say amen. Let your anger get the best of you. And Moses sinned against God. And that God told him the second time to speak to the rock. Moses did not do that. In his anger, he smote the rock with the rod again. Now God gave water out of the rock. God still blessed the people. But as far as Moses was concerned... That crossed the line and God said, Moses, I'll let you see the promised land. I'll let you look at it and gaze at it all you want to, but you're not going in. And Moses was counted among those who were not able to go into the promised land. So in, in, uh, when we got to Exodus chapter 16, as we're going through this story, I noted that that's the 66th chapter of the Bible. I'm not going not to reteach this, but it, it sure is... A very, uh, it, it bears close resemblance to the Word of God. The Word of God having 66 books, Isaiah having 66 chapters. Here we are in the 66th 
chapter of the Old Testament, God speaking exactly 66 words in our King James Bible. I, I just don't see how that's an accident. Amen. Uh, it, it, I've used this illustration before. If I'm walking down the sidewalk and I see someone has dropped a penny, I bend over and pick it up. And I take 10 more steps and I look down, I see that there's another penny on the ground. I bend down and pick it up. And I'm thinking somebody's pulling stuff out of their pocket and losing money. And so I walk 10 more paces. Sure enough, there's another penny sitting down there. Now I'm starting to wonder what's going on here. I take 10 more paces. This is the fourth time now. And I see there's a penny laying down on the ground there. Well, I start looking around for candid camera. Because I'm thinking, somebody is putting these pennies down on purpose. This is not an accident. And to prove that, I take ten more steps, another penny. Ten more steps, another penny. Ten more steps, another penny. And it just keeps going. So I know in my heart, in my mind, you'll never be able to convince me that somebody is just, you know, fooling around with change in their pocket and just by accident is dropping pennies every ten steps that I take. You'll never be able to convince me of that after about the fourth or fifth penny. I'm convinced that if I keep walking, there's going to be another penny. Amen. So when I see things like this in the Bible and I see them commonly recurring throughout Scripture, I know in my mind this cannot be an accident. It cannot be uh, something that is not deliberate or does not have a deliberate intent. This is God doing this. And God is putting, I believe, His stamp of approval upon His Word. It's an answer to a prayer that I prayed one, one, one prayer. One prayer that I prayed one time to God. And a year later, God, God answered that prayer. I won't get into that this morning. But that was just how God did it. And uh, it, to me, it just makes the Bible more real, more exciting, uh, I, I'm looking now for the next penny. Or maybe I'll say it differently. Maybe somebody's dropping hundred dollar bills. That's better, isn't it? I'll bend down for a hundred dollar bill. I may not bow down for a penny. Because it cost me three cents to bend over. So I'm losing money every time I do it. Okay? But anyway... Uh, that's just, that's just how I see the Word of God. I think God has deliberate intention in everything that happens, everything that goes on, uh, even this tragedy with his family. Uh, again, I don't have an answer. The family doesn't have an answer. But maybe one of these days, God will share why he did what he did. Some of you, I know, have been through a situation similar to this. And... Uh, Maybe God didn't give you an answer yet, but hey, we've got eternity. Amen? We've got eternity. So now, uh, we're going to deal with this candlestick for a minute. Okay? I saw, John said he saw seven golden candlesticks. This is Revelation 1, if you want to turn there and read with me. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man. Now look at that phrase, in the midst of the seven candlesticks. That's the, that middle pipe is different than the three outer candlesticks or the three lamps uh, that are on this. It is different because it contains four decorations instead of three. Those four decorations, as I mentioned last week, I believe they represent Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels. Uh, they, that's what they stand for. That's where Jesus showed up in was those four books. And in the candlestick, those four books are right in the midst of the other six candles that are on this thing. So I see a correlation with that. But he said, I looked and saw in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. So the illustration I made last week was, here is the candlestick right here. Uh, the earthly candlestick had, as you see, 39 decorations on one side from the middle over. And then on the right side, 27 decorations total. And that makes, that's how you divide the Bible up from Old Testament to New Testament. 39 books in the law. Um, 
27 books total and so on. But anyway, you have exactly 66 decorations on this candle and you have 66 books in the Bible. That candle represents the light of God given to us by way of the Holy Spirit. By the way, that candlestick is an almond tree. We learned that last Sunday. And so what do, what do trees do? They breathe. Just like your lungs, they breathe. And so Jesus breathed on his disciples and he said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says they did. But Jesus is in the midst of the word of God. When you read Genesis 1, he's there. You read Genesis 2, he's there. When you read Genesis 3, he's there. Read the book of Exodus. Read the book of Psalms. Read the book of, uh, if you can't pronounce them all, Levititus and Job and Nehemia. Okay? Thank God you don't have to pronounce them right to go to heaven. Amen. 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 This old wicked tongue of mine gets it messed up all the time. But you read these books and, and you're blessed by them. And what you don't understand, the Holy Ghost will store in you. And one of these days, you'll be thinking about something. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost will pull that verse out and you'll go, whoa! Almost crash your car doing it. Amen. That's what, I, that's what I like about life, is God almost crashes my car for me. When I get happy about the Word, all right? But there He is in the midst of the seven candlesticks. And He is in the midst of whenever two or more are gathered together in His name. I believe Jesus is in the midst of this place this morning. I don't know if you've prayed for this church service this morning, but I have. I want God to work, I want God to move, I want God to do some things. I want Him to do them in me, I want Him to do it in you. This is what I want. Now, let me get on with the message, because i got a lot to say. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, God said that He would raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God, and so on. And He said... Um, Verse 18, I will raise him up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth. There you go right there. There's a connection there with the Bible and the prophet is going to be in the midst of us. So the prophet here is in the word of God, in the midst of the word of God. But I want you to think about this as well. All of God's people, no matter who they are, no matter where they are. I had two different pastors or one pastor and one layman sent me a text this morning apparently I was on their mind and heart this morning they sent me a text this morning and said hey pastor we just want to tell you we love you we're praying for you praying for your ministry praying for your family uh, praying that God will bless and continue to work we thank you for what you do because you're a blessing to me and our family I want to tell you something there's nothing better than that for somebody to say to me that to come up to me and say pastor I'm praying for you it don't bother me. It doesn't offend me. You, in fact, you can't offend me when you say you're praying for me. I'm praying for you, Pastor. And listen, if it's meant in a way where you think I need something from God, then maybe I do. Maybe I need it from God and I don't see it and you do. And so it's okay for you to come to me and say, Pastor, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for your family. I'm praying for this church. Pastor, This I'm on my knees every day praying for this. I'm going to say, praise the Lord. God's people are praying. I want God. I want God in the midst of your prayers. Amen. I want, this, I want the living word of God to be in you while you pray. Because I guarantee you God will not allow you to pray amiss. You'll pray the right thing. You'll say the right things. The Holy Ghost will make utterances for you of things that you cannot even utter. The Holy Ghost will say the prayers better than you can pray them. We don't even know what to ask or think. God will do the work even of our prayers. God will do the work of it. Amen to that. Now, these are things in the Bible that I found that God is in the midst of them. And I'm telling you this morning, I need it. I like it. I want God... Uh, let me show you this. I'm going to, I thought I was going to use this later, but I'm going to use it first. I want God in the midst of me. Now, to be in the midst of me, 
means that I want God living and abiding in my heart. The heart, as you remember, has four chambers. Those are the four living creatures or the four angels or the four Levite priests. Those four chambers, chambers represent the four gospels. And they represent the throne of God. Does God, I'm going to ask you this morning, does God abide in your heart? And does he sit on the throne of your heart? Because let me tell you something. And I hope I scare you. There's, if there is an empty throne in your life, in your heart, I guarantee you, I know someone who wants to sit on that throne. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides. He said, I will sit also in the mount of the congregation. And then he said, I will be like the most high. So it, you, either your heart is going to be ruled over by Jesus Christ in the midst of you. Or you've left an empty house for the devil to move in. Remember that story that Jesus told about an unclean spirit being driven out of a house? And then he decides, he wanders around and decides to go back. When he goes back, he finds it swept and garnished. Somebody cleaned it out. But when he goes back, he takes seven more that are worse than he is and enters into that heart. And now you're worse off than you ever were in your life. You're worse now. You're not better. You don't have more freedom. You don't have a happy life. You don't have a smile on your face. You are miserable because you have worse spirits than you had before dwelling in the throne of your heart. My son, this is what Solomon said. My son, attend to my words. Think about that. Think about that in the context of what we're talking about. We're talking about the Bible. This is like God speaking this to Christ. Solomon speaking it to his children. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. You know what that means? It means lean in and, let, and listen to God. Lean in and listen to him. Incline thy, when you incline your ear, you'll incline your heart in that direction. Incline my ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. You can say, well, that's just a metaphor. How about this? That science has discovered. You can check me out. That there are brain cells in your heart. Just like there are in your brain. That to me solves the mystery of how it come all the time God saying in your heart, in your heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might... Well, listen, when you memorize scripture, you're not just etching them in the gray matter of your brain. You're writing them in your heart. Amen. Paul said you are our epistle written uh, and read of men. Not written with uh, pen and ink, but in the fleshy tables of the heart. Is what, what he said. You're the, you're the Bible to people's lives who do not read the Bible. Because you have it etched into your mind and you have it etched into your heart as well. Amen. So that's, that is Christ abiding in the midst of you. Where he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Keep them in the midst of thine heart for their life unto those that find them. And health to all their flesh. I want to go to the Lord in prayer because I'm going to get in some pretty heavy stuff here. All right. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, what a beautiful day it is. And I thank you, God, these people, Lord, decided not to go out uh, having fun or amusements or uh, going out doing anything else, Lord. They decided that they need to come to the house of God. 
I didn't make them come. Lord, I had nothing to do with it. That was you. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless them and bless this church and continue to use us to reach out, not just in our own area, but in areas around the world. Bless those who are watching online from all over this world right now. People in Pakistan, people in uh, Africa, people in Europe. Uh, Lord, maybe even people in places where the Bible's illegal. Lord, maybe they're watching and listening. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless them for it. Bless them and give them double portion of your word. Give them a double blessing this morning for their being faithful to your word. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for gathering us here in this place this morning. And oh, Heavenly Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help me to preach this message. And Lord, help me to preach it to me first. I need it as bad as anybody else does. And I pray, dear God, that you would give me grace to preach it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed is your word and you have magnified it even above your name. We thank you for this and we pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Now turn to Deuteronomy 23. I like this. And I, I should have had a, a graphic. It would have been real neat. I just didn't think of it. But imagine... Um, like a big square. In the middle of that square is the tabernacle as they're wandering through the wilderness. Uh, the Levites would set up the tabernacle. And then once the tabernacle was set, then the various tribes would pitch their tents in relation to the tabernacle. And understand this. That whatever tribe you were in, that was the tribe that you had to camp in. In other words, if, if you were a, a Judahite, you had, you had to camp on the east. Um, uh, yeah, on the, on the east. Is that how it goes? I think so. Yeah, on the east side of the tabernacle, that's where you had to camp. You couldn't camp anywhere else. You had your place. If you were Dan, Dan had to camp. He was the last one to go in the line. Dan had to camp in the north. He couldn't camp in the west. He couldn't camp in the east or the south. Uh, he, he couldn't camp outside the camp, wherever they got. He stayed within the camp. That was the rules that God had given to them. And so, when they moved from place to place, they set up the tabernacle. They set up, once they set the, the sanctuary up, they brought in the uh, candlestick over here, which is the, the Holy Spirit, represents the Holy Spirit. It's the Word of God. And then over here, they set up the table that had 12 fresh baked loaves. You know, that, that bread could qualify for that, I think. <clears throat> it looked unleavened to me. But anyway, fret 12 fresh loaves of bread on what was called the table of showbread. That's Christ. Uh, Psalm 23, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And that was on the north. And then on the, uh, on the, in the back there was the most holy place. And that's where they set the Ark of the Covenant and they drew a curtain to cover it because God was going to put himself in that place on that Ark that was going to be his throne. And when you looked out from a from like a hillside, you saw that God was right there in the midst, literally in the midst of his people. It's not a metaphor. It means exactly what he says. Christ abides in the midst of us today in today here in the form of his word amen i believe jesus is in this place ruling because the only authority that i have as your pastor is the authority of the word of god in as much as i give you and feed to you and and give you the the uh, unedited, unchanged, uncorrupted Word of God, then that is authoritative in your life 
And if you choose to rebel against that, you go right on ahead. I remember Brother Reg was preaching a message one time and he was preaching about uh, home discipline and how you ought to whip your children. That's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. Amen. You're, listen, you're saving. There's, my mama was saving my soul from hellfire when she whooped me, when she tore the hide off me with my own belt. The traitor. She used to, you know, this was the 70s. They used to put them little metal rings in the belt back then. Stingers. But he was preaching a message about using uh, spanking and using the rod as a form of punishment. And God doesn't just suggest it. He tells us, do this. And he had a, had a family in the church that as they come by him, the woman, just she was just boiling. Her blood was boiling. Her face was red hot. Bloodshot eyes looking at that, looking at her pastor and saying, I just don't believe in that. And Brother Reg said, well, ma'am, I don't know what to tell you. It's in the Word of God. That's what the Word of God says. I don't care what the Bible says. That's just not right. Did you hear what she said? I don't care what the Bible says. In other words... The Bible has no authority in her life. It has no place of authority, no throne, nothing. And again, if God does not abide on your throne, you've got it sitting empty and that's dangerous. It's deadly dangerous. Uh, I haven't preached on that in a long time and... Maybe I'll do that again sometime. Now, I don't believe you ought to beat your kids for every little thing they do. I think that's abuse. I think there are abuses of God's word in this issue of, of how to treat children. But I also think on the, on the other end of that, there are people who are so afraid of abuse or say they're afraid of abuse and they won't touch their children at all. That doesn't work. It never has. And what you're doing is you're creating future felons is what you're doing you are creating future felons i guarantee you somebody in your family is going to spend time in jail now um anyway for the lord thy god walketh in the midst of thy camp now i need here's here's my interpretation of this well, one possible interpretation of this the camp i believe could be this church this is our camp. Amen? All of us are headed in the same direction. Amen? Are we? All of us trying to go to heaven. Amen? And don't want to go any other place. Well, I don't know how to get there. I don't know how... To what kind of rocket to build? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how in the world that God could even get us to that place as far away as it is. But God knows the way. And if we need anything in this camp, we need the Lord our God in the midst, walking in the midst of this camp, walking with us, talking with us, going with us and leading us into the promised land because I don't know how to get there myself. Amen. He said, For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy that he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. I mentioned earlier this morning about how to be a good thing for you to start your day on your knees confessing sins and, and asking God to remove them. Or maybe, maybe, if you don't want to do that, if it's too early, do it the night before. That way you have better sleep. Amen. But ask God to forgive you. Ask God to wash your heart out. Ask God to clean you up. I'm here telling you this morning, I'm confessing sins that I did 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I'm confessing things and ashamed of things that I did in my youth, in my younger days that I would want to talk about. I don't want to, I don't want to go back and revisit that. I don't, I just, I want it gone. 
But every now and then, boy, I tell you what, I mean, something hits me and I just feel, I just get guilt all over me. And I just, nothing helps except to go to God and say, God, I am sorry. God, I'm sorry again. Now, I know God forgave me the first time I prayed, but it don't hurt you to keep praying it again. Amen. Let God know that you're still sorry for what you did. And you still don't want to go back to those days. Say amen. But I'm part of the camp and I need the camp. Because that's where Christ is. I need to be in church this morning. In fact, that's what I prayed. I need to be in church this morning just like anybody else does. Maybe sometimes I need it worse than you do. But I need it. And I need the camp. Psalm 46, 4, there is a river. Oh, I like this. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. Now, what's he talking about? That river. Christ, the water of his word, his blood, his word again. And he said, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. When you pray for help, would you rather God help you soon? Or would you say, God, if you want to wait 30, 40 years to, to take care of this, I'm fine with that. I, I can't remember praying that to God lately. But I'm telling you, you need the camp. You need it. In all the years that I've been a member of this church, a member of a church, pastoring, uh, this is the second church I've pastored. I've seen people come and I've seen them leave. Sometimes they stay for years before they leave. Sometimes they don't stay very long at all and then they leave. And it's not that they're going to some other camp. They just quit going. Now the camp's going to the promised land. You want to go to the promised land, get in line with the camp. Amen. Pitch your tent where God tells you. And do the things that God calls upon you to do. And be part of that camp. I love, listen, I, 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 I just enjoy listening while everybody's coming in in the morning and hearing them laugh, hearing them talk, shake hands, hug one another. I, I love that. I do not want to take that away from everybody, so I'm going to let it go. Amen. And uh, then after we sing the song, I, before you sit down, let's do it again. Amen. I, listen, I like that. And uh, some people may not. I, that's, that's up to them. But I want a place where everybody knows that when they come in here, they're going to be loved no matter what. No matter what, they're going to be loved. And if you need prayed for... Do not be ashamed to stand and say, Pastor, I'm not going to say much of anything. I'm just letting you know that I need prayed for this morning. That's all you got to do. And we'll have an inquisition. And No, we won't do that. <laughs> but you'd be surprised maybe at somebody who might know what's going on and come to you and say, Hey, I dealt with the same thing. Let me tell you what God did. Amen? So, I need the camp. Because God is in the midst of the camp. And I need to be where God is. Amen? Now, there's a, there's a commandment that God gave through Joshua. This is after Moses has, has died. Joshua is in charge now. And Joshua stands up in Joshua 6... 
and says, And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. When you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Do you know what that teaches? Well, we have, let's see, we got a cursed thing, a cursed, a cursed. What's in there like three times? And uh, God's letting you know that he doesn't want you messing with things that have a curse on it. They're going to be destroyed in the last day. They're going to be burned up one of these days. They're part of this world. They're part of the love of this world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And God, along with cursing the thing, will curse the one who holds the thing. The one who loves the thing more than you love your God. And God made it pretty clear. If you keep yourselves away from the cursed thing, God, God said, I'll bless you. But if you touch the accursed thing, and God left this verse open for multiple interpretations, and I think that in the very last of the last days, there is going to be an accursed thing that God will open our eyes and we'll say, that's the accursed thing. God said, don't touch that. I'm not touching that. I am not touching that. Lest you make yourselves a curse. God is saying that to those people. And he means it. He says, I'll bless you if you keep your hands off of it and stay away from it. But if you pick it up and take it with you, I'll not only curse you, I'll curse the entire camp. And I'm going to trouble it. Now, I have literally seen times where God allowed me to identify uh, certain people. This goes back to the days, I'm, I'm thinking of someone in the days when we had a daycare here. And there was a family that that came in and that woman was nothing but trouble and I know it I know it for a fact she was trying to meddle in business that was not her business she was trying to uh, I'll go ahead and tell you what she was doing she was trying to get our current daycare director in trouble by me so that I would fire the current director and hire her to be the director. I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up. And God showed me one day, I, man, I was just, I was so tired of it. I was so deeply burdened. I had, it was awful. And I went to the word. I said, God, show me something in your word. And I opened the Bible up and I looked at where I was and I'm going, oh, it's not going to be there. And, bef and I went to turn it and God said, do, 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 do. look down at the page. And when I read the page, I went, oh, that's it. And it had to do with Jezebel and her witchcrafts. And... I did something, I, I, I'm not going to spend any time getting into it, but I just kind of very softly put my foot down on an issue that had come up amongst the workers that we had there. And in 10 minutes, she had gathered everything that she had in that place and got in her car and drove off and hadn't seen her since. Brother George, God exposed who that was. And I, I didn't name anybody by now. I just wrote out this little letter and said, everybody read this. This is kind of how I want things. I, I didn't name anybody. Boom, gone. And I'm telling you, when the accursed thing is in the midst of God's people, 
God's people are going to be troubled. Now, I'm telling you this because the devil will tell you that there is no real consequences for the things that you do wrong. That you can slide by and, and get by with them and it'll be okay. All you got to do is ask for forgiveness and it'll go away. If you are a part, if you love this church and you see yourself as being a part of it, whether you are a, uh, an elected member or not, God will trouble this entire congregation because of your sin. And don't think he won't do it. In fact, that was Joshua 6. Right in Joshua 7, it's already happening. God says up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee. It, it already happened. The first battle they fought. Achan took gold and silver and a Babylonian garment, hid them under his tent so that nobody could find him. And God troubled uh, Joshua. God troubled the army of Israel. Joshua went into battle presumptuously without God telling him to and lost a bunch of men over it. Joshua cried and wailed and went on, carried on in front of God. And God said, what are you crying for? If you would have done what I told you to do, this, this wouldn't be happening. Now rise up, dry those tears off, and let's take care of this thing. And they did. They took Achan, his wife, his children, and everything that they had, stoned them with stones, and then burnt them. God was serious about it. As God will be serious about it in the midst of this congregation. If you think that you can live a sinful lifestyle, constantly getting away with your sin, I'm here to tell you, you are, you are asking for trouble. There will be trouble in your house. There will be trouble in this church. There will be trouble in your family. There will be trouble at work. Everywhere there will be trouble. O oh, Israel, thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. Sins and things that you thought were gone from you, now they're coming back because you have no power whatsoever to stand against your enemies, to stand against the things that you used to not have a problem with. Now it's a problem, now it's an issue all over again. And it's because you allowed the wrong thing in your life. Now, turn to 2 Samuel 23. I call this bravery. And I don't know why I'm necessarily seeing this the way I see it. But I like it. And I want everybody to listen to this part, okay? In fact, I may be in trouble here. I may be almost out of message. <gasps> Second Samuel twenty three twenty. This is about David's mighty men. Um, in verse eight, these be the names of the mighty men of David, whom David had: the Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino, the Iznite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. Now, if you don't believe the Bible, you don't believe that. But I believe that one man took one spear and killed 800 of the enemy. I believe that. I believe God can give a man that, that much strength. I believe Samson literally took the two pillars that were holding up the house of Dagon... And brought them in and collapsed that entire house. That's what I believe. I believe Samson took the jawbone of an ass. And just went and whooped and beat and killed. Because that's, that's what he had in his hand. Amen. And I'm just, I'm just telling you, I believe the Bible. It, just, it feels better to believe it. Amen. I don't go to bed at night going, man, I just can't handle that. I just, I don't know. That just feels better believing it. Now, 
Here's one of the mighty men in verse 20. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many, many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. Now, he went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in the time of snow. So that'll be tomorrow. Amen. So if you feel like killing a lion in a pit all by yourself, tomorrow's the day to do it. Amen. Amen. See, that snow has a, has a place, doesn't it? Let me, tell you, let me tell you what God hit me with when I first read this. And I've, I've read this dozens of times. I love this passage. And I love how God used these men. But here's what I get out of this. The hardest pit to look down into for a man or a woman or whoever, the most difficult pit to look down into is the pit of your own life. It takes a lot of bravery to look into the pit of your own life and face to face with your own lions. But that really isn't the hard part. The hard part is taking a sword, jumping down in the pit. Now, I'm content with the lion staying in the pit. But Benaiah is a mighty man of God. And he's not content. And he sees a lion in a pit in the time of snow. And he says to himself, that is an abomination before God. I'm going to kill that lion. I don't care if I have to jump down in that pit with just me and him all by himself. I'm going to jump down in there and I'm going to kill him. And that is exactly what he did. And I look at this story and I'm like, that ain't me. Well, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm, I'm short selling Christ because if Christ compels me to do it and Christ is it was with me, then bring, let's do this. Okay? I feel like whooping a lion in a pit today. Amen? Okay? If Christ is in it, that's, that's what I would do. But it's difficult to look inside your own life. To measure yourself up against just the Ten Commandments. Just, just measure yourself up against those Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Honor thy father. Uh, th thou shalt remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet. When you measure yourself up against God's commandments and you find that you fall way short of His righteousness, then you know there's something wrong. And you know what? It's time to deal with it. Somebody told me this morning, I was shaking hands and they were saying that somebody they know, he's got some health problems and he's already said that he needs to quit doing this and he needs to quit doing that and uh, maybe he needs to rededicate his life to the Lord and I'm going, maybe, maybe nothing because she said he's 80 years old and I'm like, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. That clock is winding down on that guy. Thinking nothing. You need, to, you need to get things right with God. 
and do it right early. Amen. You can do it where you are. You can do it by yourself. You can, you can do it in the car. You can do it at your house. You can be out in the woods somewhere just kind of walking a little trail. You can, do, you can meet God anywhere and any place. And I promise you he'll be there and he'll comfort you and he'll lead you into repentance. And God will change your life. But you've got to be ready to look down in that pit and see exactly who you really are. Not what everybody says about you. Not what your friends say. Not what your loved ones say. But what God says about you. That's the only thing that matters and that's the only thing that counts. And if you're not willing to do that, then you'll never be right with God and you'll never be satisfied. Ever. Bravery. That's how I define bravery. Not only looking down in that pit and seeing yourself as the lion, but jumping down in there and take the word of God with you and say, I'm going to kill it. Now, 1 Samuel 18, watch this. A couple more verses and I'm done. It came to pass. Now, this is after Saul has already rejected the word of the Lord. And Samuel has already approached him and said, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected thee from being king. So God has already separated Saul away from him. And God is not going to speak to Saul, not through dreams, not through the Urim and the Thummim, not through um, uh, uh, the prophets, no way, no how. That was not Samuel that came up out of the dead. That was not Samuel. That was a familiar spirit because God had already said, I'm not speaking to Saul. I don't care who you think that is. You think it's Samuel? Fine, think it's Samuel. But I'm telling you, I've already declared that Samuel's not going to say a word to you. Samuel's dead. And you think Samuel come up out of the ground to give you some kind of new message that God wouldn't give you? Really? And... uh some people just need to think about this for a while. Some people still say, well, I, th I think that was uh, Samuel. Uh, if you just stop and contemplate it in your mind for a while, maybe God will change your mind. Just as that spirit was not Samuel, so there is coming another Jesus that is not Jesus. That story is telling us how it's going to happen. Okay, so mark it down. But anyway... So this is after that's happened. It came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied in the midst of the house. He's preaching. So do you know what this represents? It represents all of the pastors, preachers, evangelists, so-called prophets, the men, the women, who say that God has given them new revelations, God has given them new words, and they prophesy falsely, and they do it because they have an evil spirit in them. And listen, that's not far-fetched. The, the day that uh, uh, Jehoshaphat was inquiring about going into battle with King, uh, King Ahab, Jehoshaphat said, do you not have somebody who can speak for God? Uh, Je uh, King Ahab called for his prophets, 400 men came out there, and all 400 of them said, oh, God said you could go into battle tomorrow, and God's going to deliver you, and he's going to deliver your family. Oh, it's going to be a great victory. So Saul says, see there, or excuse me, Ahab says, see there, it's all in the, it's all in the works. God, these men are God's men. And Jehoshaphat said, don't you have somebody else? And Ahab said, well, I've got this guy named Micaiah, but I don't like him. He's, he preaches too long. He only lets us have one Bible. We can't sing them new songs that are in the other churches. He won't, I mean, we just, we just don't like him anymore. Bring him in here. I want to hear what he's got to say. Micaiah came in there and said, I saw the spirits gathered there in front of God. And God said, who shall I send to be a lying spirit in the mouth 
of the prophets unto Ahab. And one spirit said, I'll do it. God said, how are you going to do it? He said, I'm going to be literally in their mouth and I'm going to be speaking a lie from their mouth. And God said, go do it. And let me tell you something. When it comes to this world that we live in right now, some of the cults that were really struggling back in the 70s, the 80s, the early 90s, they have found uh, a new manure pile in the internet. Where they can uh, make new converts and twist scriptures and get everybody to like it on Facebook. I'm going to tell you something. Before I like anything on Facebook, I find out who said it, where it came from. Because I'm not, I'm not going for that stuff. I like, the, I like the King James Bible. Hey man, it gets a big from me. I like it. But Saul prophesied with a false spirit in him. By the way, that's not, that's not the only place that happened. Ezekiel 39. He said, I will send fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. And they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. And I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. God's people had polluted his name. And when you pollute God's name, you might as well pollute His Word because God has magnified His Word above His name. The Bible says that. Mike Hogger didn't say that. The God said that. And He said, I will make my name holy, known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen, that's us Gentiles, the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. How would you like it? If you had family members that were just as lost as lost could be. All of a sudden wake up one day and call you and say, man, I need you. What do you need? I need God. How would you feel? Amen. We're waiting for a son to do that. Dad, I need God. Then now the heathen shall know. But we can't pollute God's holy name anymore. How do you pollute it? Well, let's take the word Christian. What does that mean? Christ-like. Okay? So you go around and you tell everybody you're a Christian or you make people believe you're a Christian. But all those people know things about you and they know you're not. That's, that's not a good way to be in front of people. And you can invite them to church. You can talk to them about the Lord all you want to. They are not coming. They're not coming. In Joel chapter 2 verse 26, God says a very similar thing. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people. Listen to this now. This is, the, this is the gist of it. For those of you who have addictions and you're ashamed of what you've turned into. And you're ashamed of the things that you've done. And that shame doesn't leave. God said, I'll deal wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. How would you like that? Amen. What kind of blessing would that be to you? How much money would you spend getting that if it costs money? How much, how much would you be willing to beg, borrow, steal from somebody? Of course, if you stole it from somebody, you couldn't be unashamed of that. That would be... But that's... It would be worth a billion dollars to me. 
to never be ashamed ever again. God said in verse 27, he said it again, and ye shall know that I'm in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. I, one of my favorite phrases in the Bible is where God says, and ye shall know that I am the Lord and you shall know that I'm the Lord. And when I do this, then, then you shall know that I'm the Lord. When I do this, then Pharaoh's going to know that I'm the Lord. When Pharaoh sees that water coming back down on his chariots and his soldiers and then himself, Pharaoh's going to go, oh, that was the Lord. Too late. Amen? Too late. That's, listen, I, that's the kind of blessing that I want in my life. That's the kind of blessing, look at here. Out of scriptures. Out of sermons. That's the kind of life I want to lead. I fall short of it too many times. But I ask God for mercy. God is there for mercy. But God is also there sometimes to whoop the fire out of me. Chasing me like a son, like a father would chasten his son. Or in my case, like a mama chasing a son. And... Uh, that's how I want God to be in my life. I want God to be my father. Well, if I want God to be my father, then God's going to say to me, Mike, give me your belt. Because I'm going to have to deal with some things. And I guarantee you, God does. And that's the relationship that I have with my heavenly father. Is that he takes care of business with this son. Who gets ashamed every now and then. And God just wants to heal that. And he knows he can. But he has got to drive it out first. Amen. He's got to drive it out first. Now let me say this to whoever this is for. You may be waiting. As far as giving your life to the Lord. You may be waiting. For God to drive out your sinful nature. To take away from you all your, um, your desires, your lust, your pride. You may be waiting for God to do all of that before you come to Him. And you'll say, well God, if you take this away from me, or God, you take that away from me, or God, you do this in my life, then I'll start serving you and I'll worship you and, and uh, I'll get my life right. Most of the time, what I've seen is that God says, I'll take you as you are. I'll take you right the way you are. I'll clean you up as we go. That is, that is the, the doctrine of the sanctification of the saints. In my soul is sanctified, but my flesh is rebellious. And God then spends time in us cursing this flesh and putting it down so that we have God's control over our wicked desires. And all it takes is asking Him. Just ask. And if he doesn't do it today, ask tomorrow. If he doesn't do it tomorrow, ask a week from now. Don't give up. Don't stop asking. Let's bow our heads.